I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us for Dialogue at the Aldrich. This is the second program of this year's Dialogue series, and the purpose of this series is to introduce major figures in American intellectual life. Last week we had the opportunity to hear Cleve Gray present a very stimulating talk on the seduction and betrayal in the contemporary arts. And this week we're going to have the opportunity to hear Hilton Kramer discuss criticism in the contemporary arts. <coughs> Mr. Kramer was born in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and he studied at Syracuse University. He did his undergraduate work there. And his graduate studies were at Indiana University, Columbia, and Harvard Universities, as well as the New School for Social Research. He's taught at Indiana University, Columbia University, excuse me, Colorado University, and also at Yale. And he has lectured extensively at museums and universities throughout the country. <coughs> he began his career as a literary, a, a literary critic in 1950, and it wasn't until 1953 that he went into art criticism. He was the editor of Arts Magazine for many years, an art critic for the nation. He joined the staff of the New York Times first as an art news editor, and then as an art critic. And later on, he was given the position as head art critic for the New York Times, a position which he held for quite a few years. <coughs> when he resigned that position, <coughs> he resigned it to do something very exciting and challenging in my eyes and that was to become the editor of The New Criterion, um, a fascinating publication that addresses issues in music, the literary arts, and the visual arts, and a publication that we receive here at the Aldrich and enjoy every month. <coughs> He's also been writing for The New York Observer, which um, is a very exciting newspaper, a uh, very exciting publication. And in the New York Observer, um, I've been following many articles that he's been writing on particular issues in the contemporary arts. And today we're going to have Mr. Kramer address one of those issues, and that is the area of criticism in the contemporary arts. And now we're going to begin, and thank you all for joining us, and welcome Mr. Kramer. <laughs> Thank you very much. The um, particular issue that I'm going to be um, addressing today is one that I think uh, embraces the entire art scene of the 1980s. Um, and tries to place what's happened to criticism within it, because I think what's happened to criticism is very much a, um, a reflection of and a coefficient of the peculiar development that the art scene um, has uh, undergone uh, in this most extraordinary of uh, decades uh, in this century in terms of the quantity of art, uh, of new art that's uh, produced and exhibited, uh, the sheer numbers of artists, and so on. I think the best way to understand what has happened to the contemporary art scene and its critics in this next to last decade of the 20th century is to see the many ways in which it resembles its historical counterpart in the Paris of the later 19th century. For today we are living with the consequences of what seems to me one of the great reversals of cultural history. A reversal that has made what I would call avant-gardeism, which must be distinguished 
from the kind of authentic avant-garde uh, which no longer exists, which has made what I call avant-gardeism the contemporary equivalent of 19th century academicism and relegated those artists who remain opposed to the new avant-gardist orthodoxy relegates them to the realm of the outsiders. Most of us, I think, carry a certain picture in our heads of the oppressive and reactionary institutions that made it so difficult for artists of real quality to survive and prosper in 19th century Paris. We've all been brought up on that history of reaction and martyrdom. Simply to name those institutions is to conjure up a world in which Philistinism was the dominant cultural power. The state-sponsored annual or biannual salons whose governing committees were adamant in their resistance to new artistic ideas the academies that were closed to any but the most conventional approaches to art, the press with its timid core of critics that did little more than ratify established reactionary opinion, and the patrons, the collectors, who more often than not were terrified at the thought of embracing or even permitting anything that deviated from accepted taste. From Courbet to Manet to Gauguin and Van Gogh and well into the early careers of even Picasso and Matisse, what we would now call the establishment stood firm, if only for a generation or so, against the acceptance of the greatest art of the period. That art came to be identified with the concept of the avant-garde, and it is as monuments and ornaments of an authentic avant-garde culture that the masterworks of modernist art have become enshrined in our museums, in our textbooks, and in the artistic imagination itself. What was once of necessity a vital anti-establishment art has been transformed in the course of time into a tradition. We might even say into the tradition, uh, the tr a tradition that is now seen to stand in a direct line of descent from the masters of the Renaissance and the Baroque and the Neoclassic and the Romantic epochs in Western art. Toward this tradition, the art world of the 1980s stands in a very curious and ambiguous relation. There is certainly no shortage of adulation and publicity for the masterworks of the past, as we can see in the steady succession of so-called blockbuster exhibitions that are now the favorite enterprise of both our major art museums and of the government and corporate sponsors uh, that finance such events. It would probably be a mistake, however, to assume too quickly from either the frequency or the popularity of these superscale exhibitions that the public derives from them any very clear conception of what great art is. Still less have we any reason to assume that these exhibitions have the effect of enriching the creation of new art. Of course, there are artists among us for whom an encounter with the great art of the past is crucial in providing inspiration, and not only aesthetic inspiration. In art, there is also what might be called moral inspiration, and only the greatest art uh, can
can offer it. But it is my impression anyway that such artists who are really capable of deriving either aesthetic or moral inspiration from the great artists of the past, that such artists are now as they always were in the past, a tiny and beleaguered minority. And they are unlikely to be the artists who receive the lion's share of attention, publicity, and patronage from the many institutions that now devote their resources to supporting all this new art. These institutions, the great majority of our museums and galleries, the vast number of critics and publicists and collectors and curators, the various government agencies and corporations and private foundations and universities, all of these now tend to be as conformist in their taste and as terrified of straying beyond the boundaries of fashionable opinion as the now despised Philistines of the 19th century. In some respects, the new Philistines are, in my opinion, even worse than their 19th century predecessors. For at least it could be said for the reactionaries of the 19th century that they were under the illusion that they were resisting what was new in the name of something sacred, in the name of a conception of tradition which, though we now know it to have been feeble and mistaken, was in principle, at least, an attempt to keep alive the standards of the past. It was in the nature of 19th century Philistinism to fail in that task, for its conception of tradition was too shallow and too pious, too much a matter of cultural wish fulfillment, and too little a matter of intelligence sensibility and knowledge for it to serve as anything more than a sort of primitive desire to keep the future at bay. It is, I think, central to the pathos of 19th century bourgeois culture that while it initiated in the realms of technology and economic development, the kind of dynamism that we still have every reason to admire and every reason to be grateful for, that in the realm of art it attempted to resist a parallel dynamism of development in the name of an illusory stability. Art, in the old Philistine view of it, was meant to be immune to significant change an attitude that condemned the artists who subscribe to such a view, the artists of the academy and the salon, to a moribund course. In actuality, of course, it was the artists who opposed this moribund course, the artists who came to be seen as the leaders of the modernist movement, who proved to be the true custodians of tradition. Which is why, in my view, it is such a great mistake, a fundamental mistake, to look upon modernism as the enemy of tradition. In one of its most important aspects, certainly, modernism is in fact a protracted debate, a debate conducted by artists and their critics about the nature of tradition and the ways in which it can be sustained and transmitted as a creative impulse. This is not, to be sure, the only attitude toward tradition that the modernist movement harbored, 
for it always contained an element of critical nihilism that stood for something very different. <coughs> for the mockery, if not the outright destruction, of both art and tradition in the name of one or another program of personal emancipation or political rebellion. It was this nihilist element in modernism, most conspicuously associated with Dada and its vast cultural progeny, that has been programmatically anti-bourgeois in its essential ethos and most cynical as well as successful in its manipulation of bourgeois institutions as a means of triumphing over the class and the culture it most vehemently despises. Although it came out of the modernist movement and drew much of its authority and energy from its association with modernism, this nihilist impulse in art was in fact profoundly anti-modernist in its basic outlook. For the true nature of the relation in which it stood to modernism did not openly declare itself until fairly recently, until the rise of what came to be known as postmodernism, which made its debut with the advent of pop art in the 1960s, and now, some 20 and more years later, has all but swamped the contemporary art scene in the Western world. If we ask what this phenomenon of postmodernist art and culture amounts to, we mustn't expect a simple answer, for it is in the nature of the nihilist impulse, of the nihilist impulse that is its driving force, to be complicated, devious, and paradoxical. Postmodernism operates, for example, by means of parody and what is called appropriation. It thrives on quoting and cannibalizing the art of the past for the purposes of mockery and ridicule. It turns every tradition into the materials of camp and makes no distinction between the glories of high art and the trashy gratifications of kitsch. In the world of postmodernist sensibility, everything, including the glories of high art, even its highest achievements, everything is reducible to kitsch. And kitsch remains its preferred mode of expression. At the same time, however, Postmodernism aspires to a kind of mock glory of its own. And so what begins as parody and pastiche and appropriation sooner or later aspires to be taken seriously as the equal of the very art that the postmodernist sensibility has been obliged to ransack and trash in order to exist at all. Although it is essentially a form of aesthetic and cultural parasitism that remains abjectly dependent on its host culture for the basic materials of its existence, postmodernism nonetheless assumes the posture of a rival to that culture, a posture that is now accepted and even celebrated by the society whose tastes and standards are so shabbily ridiculed in the art that bears the postmodernist stamp. What is imperative to understand about the, the art scene of the 1980s then, both its artists and its criticism, is that its dominant impulse which is the postmodernist impulse, bears the same negative relation to modernism 
as uh, to modernism as a tradition as that of the Philistine reactionaries of the 19th century. Only today, the new Philistinism has, as we say, appropriated the gestures and attitudes of avant-gardism as the most effective means at its disposal for advancing its cynical cause. But this avant-gardism is itself a parody that only apes the more superficial attributes of modernism in order to subvert its fundamental seriousness. To a genuine avant-garde culture, this avant-gardism may, can make no contribution for the conditions in which a genuine and authentic avant-garde might again arise, no longer exist. And they no longer exist because bourgeois culture has effectively assimilated what avant-garde culture had to offer it. And contrary to the pieties that still dominate the cultural thought um, of certain radicals, what the avant-garde at its greatest moments had to offer bourgeois society was not a revolution, but a purification of its aesthetic and cultural sensibilities. It is precisely this program of purification and redefinition in the realm of art and culture that the avant-gardism of the postmodern era is designed to subvert and reverse. Hence the revival of all that was worst, all that was most despised in the academic and salon painting of 19th century France, a revival that has been central to the very spirit of the postmodernist movement. Under the sponsorship of postmodernism, the pictorial vulgarities and inanities which once filled the salon exhibitions in the Paris of Manet and Pizarro and Cezanne, and that in the heyday of the, po of the, in the, heyday of the modernist era were properly consigned to the oblivion of the storage bins from which in our optimism, we certainly never expected them to emerge again as objects to admire. These have all now been rehabilitated and are now offered to us as models of aesthetic and cultural excellence. Uh, a few weeks ago, we uh, were at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris and um, although there are a great many things one can say about the Musée d'Orsay, certainly one of the most repulsive aspects of it is the way it brings back all the academic enemies of uh, Courbet and Manet and Bizarro and Cezanne and accords them a kind of parity uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with their modernist uh, uh, rivals who suffered so much at their hands. Such revivals in that respect, I suppose we could say that um, the Musée d'Orsay represents in one of its aspects one of the uh, triumphs of postmodernism. Such revivals of the dead, for it is still dead as art, mm -hmm. such revivals of the dead can only occur if they serve to advance the cause of the living. It would have been unimaginable for all this academic trash to have been revived and restored to public admiration in the years when the influence of Picasso and Matisse and Mondrian and Miro and Kandinsky was paramount. For the very existence of the School of Paris was predicated on the assumption that such kitsch 
had been permanently expelled from the realm of serious art. It would have been laughed at in the 1950s as well, in the heyday of the abstract expressionist movement in New York. But that movement, as I think we can see in retrospect, was probably the last that can be regarded as a genuine avant-garde phenomenon. And in the period that followed, the period that elevated such figures as Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg and Andy Warhol to the status of masters, the great reversal I have spoken of began to make itself felt. And with the advent of pop art in the 60s, the new era was upon us. Andy Warhol was its guiding spirit, Marcel Duchamp, its patron saint, and a rampant nihilism masquerading as avant-gardism, its governing impulse. With a figure like Warhol, apotheosized now as the embodiment of everything we are urged to admire, in the realm of art and culture, there was every reason to look back to the kitsch of the, of the 19th century salon as something to be treasured. Warhol, in fact, led the way in this revival. Um, I, can't, uh, I couldn't uh, find the exact date, but I remember very specifically Warhol being invited by the Museum of Art at the Rhode Island School of Design to organize an exhibition of the things he, m he most admired in their permanent collection. And he went right into the storeroom and brought out Bouguereau. That was the signal. Warhol led the way in this revival, which is now in the museums, in the universities, in the art journals and in the sales rooms, not to mention in criticism and in the media, embraced with such incredible enthusiasm, mindlessness and tastelessness. What we are witnessing in the art world at the end of the 1980s is, through the museums, through criticism, and through the market, the institutionalization of this thoroughly corrupt avant-gardism on a vast scale. The art museums offer little, if any, resistance to its advancement. The galleries, of which there are now said to be more than 500 in Manhattan alone, are thriving on it. The critics, alas, the critics, most of them anyway, ratify this trash as passionately as their predecessors praised the kitchmakers of the 19th century. And the universities, alas for the universities, the universities study it as if it were an art worthy of their interest. If not for our vivid memories of what happened in the last century, when the greatest art of the period stood firm against the first wave of this Philistinism, and did so at great personal sacrifice, there would indeed be reason to despair over the fate that had befallen the art of the 1980s. But from the heroic example those modernist artists set um, in the last century, we know that there will always be artists who, in order to remain true to the demands of their vocation, will be opposed to what is now said to constitute success in the art world. Such artists face a challenge, however, that is in many ways even more difficult than that faced by the independent artists of the 19th century. They can no longer avail themselves 
of the kind of vital bohemian culture that in the 19th century offered the rebel artist a spiritual as well as a physical haven. And they must now be prepared in an era in which the insignia of independence and rebellion in art have been so effectively appropriated by the avant-gardist Philistines, they must be prepared to be dismissed as reactionaries or something worse mm -hmm. for whatever resistance they may offer to the prevailing climate. This, there is, too, a, a problem in the sheer scale of the art world today. There are now so many more artists, or at least people claiming to be artists, so many more exhibitions, so many more galleries and dealers, so many more critics, or at least people claiming to be critics, and so much more writing about art and so much more hype, and so much more publicity. And yet, in the expanded scale of the art world today, which so much of the time, I think, looms for many of us as a dark cloud destined to shut out all the light of intelligence, there is nonetheless a bit of a silver lining to be discerned. For the very bigness of the art world uh, means that it can no longer be completely mo monolithic. And it offers the artist who has the courage of his independence to find a place in it. Ours is still a free society, a freer society, in fact, than the one faced by the independent artists of the 19th century. And there is still room in it for the artist who has the will and determination and gifts to go his own way. Those who lack a firm resolve will either drop out or conform to the shifting fashions of the day, as such artists have always done. There are days now when all of us who cherish the ideal of quality and independence in art have every reason to feel that the 1980s have marked a nadir for everything they wish to be achieved and preserved. This is indeed, in my opinion, a grim period, and all the more so because it presents such a happy, contented, successful, smug, and insouciant face to the world. But we can take some solace, I think, in the realization that failed art, no matter how universally acclaimed in its time, remains what it is, a failure and that much can be accomplished simply by calling things by their right name. And just to reassure ourselves that at least much of what we observe happening in the, uh, among artists who emerge into the limelight today uh, has happened before, though not exactly on the same scale. I want to close with a passage um, that a very great artist, already well established at the time, a passage from an interview he gave in 1936, more than 50 years ago. This artist said, Today, my young contemporaries know how to struggle only when they are poor. But all that stops the moment they balance their budgets. Compared to these people, 
who, be, who begin their shameful decline at the age of 30, of course nowadays it begins even sooner, <laughs> compared to these people who begin their shameful decline at the age of 30, how much I admire artists like Bonnard and Mayol, who of course were already quite on in years, uh, 1936. These two will continue to struggle until their last breath. Each year of their old age marks a new birth. The great ones develop and grow as they get older. But what can I say about the, the, these young buffoons who think only of the next cocktail party, who need no more than a living room carpet and a princess to begin groveling and showing off. Well, that, those remarks were made by Miro in 1936 about the people who were coming up in the Surrealist movement. Uh, it was never ideal for a serious artist. Uh, it's only perhaps a little or a lot less ideal today than it's always been. Thank you.